good morning. Can we begin to bless the name of the Lord? Come on, all over the house, would you stand and begin to bless the name of Jesus just for about 10 seconds? Come on, open up your mouths and Shabbat the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. If you have a praise, would you just Shabbat the Lord? Hallelujah! Come on, all over the house, it's too many of us to be this quiet. you come to do but I came to give God praise come on find you another neighbor and say neighbor I don't know what you came to do but since you sit near me I dare you to give God a glory hallelujah hallelujah if you're joining with us virtually we ask that you share this live and that you let us know where you're from one more time bless the name of the Lord hallelujah hallelujah Lord you are good Thank you, Jesus. Would you just put your hands together? This is a song that everybody knows. Hallelujah. We're going to make a big choir this morning. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. 
in Brooklyn. Before I pray, could you help me to celebrate the angel of this house who labored in the vineyard for 50 years uninterrupted. Dr. Jackson, I salute you for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we bless you now. We invoke your presence right now, Lord God. Father, I thank you for everything that you have done and all that you're going to do here at Brooklyn. Even, God, as we come to worship and celebrate you, God, we celebrate the angel of this house as well. We thank you, God, for 50 years, God, uninterrupted, God. We thank you, Lord God, for how you kept him, how he labored in the vineyard these 50 years. So, God, we thank you. I'm asking you now, God, saturate this atmosphere with glory divine. Send now that Shekinah glory in the name of Jesus. Father, you said I can decree a thing. So therefore I'm decreeing, I'm declaring right now, Lord God, that his ladder shall be greater than his path. Father, because you said you will, you will bless his hand, the work of his hand. So God, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor for everything he's going to do. We pray now, God, that you have your way in this service in the name of Jesus the Christ. Father, I pray now, God, for the manservant that are going to bring forth the word this morning, Lord. I pray, God, that you use him. Use his mind. Use his mind to think with. Use his tongue to talk with. All of you and less of him. That we don't be impressed by him, but, God, that we'll be blessed by you. Now do what you always do. Place your ability on his ability that supersede his ability. We'll give you praise. We'll thank you in advance for everything that you've done, all that you're going to do, God. We just said thank you, Lord. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being Jehovah Shalom. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh. Thank you for being El Shaddai. You are the God of more than enough more anointing, more wisdom. Now send that anointing, anoint this place, everyone that sat under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that their heart are ready to receive this word this morning. So I said, ooh, we Jesus, ooh, we Jesus, ooh, we Jesus, have your way, have your way this morning. We surrender, we surrender our way to your way. We surrender our will to your will. Have your way. Do what you want to do. Is in the name of Jesus. God Almighty, have your way. We surrender now. We ask it all now in the only name that matter, Jesus the Christ. Amen and praise God.
Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I will be reading from Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, King James Version. And it says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastures according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall come, call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, all of the nation shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the Lord to the light that I have given for inheritance unto your fathers. Thanks to be God. Amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can you just put your hands together and give God <laughs> praise? Thank God for little Miss J. Divine in the reading of the scripture. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. What a delight, what an awesome honor, what a, what a privilege to stand again at the sacred desk here at the Brookland Baptist Church to share in worship with you. Amen. We want to thank our Facebook friends who are watching us on Facebook and those who are viewing from live stream. We want to thank God for you joining us in service today. We also have some special guests that are with us. We thank you this morning. Can you put your hands together for our guests today? There is a scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. The Message Bible reads it like this. It says, And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you in your obedience. Here's the part. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. So that's exactly what we're doing today, friends. We have gathered to overwhelm our pastor with love. So much appreciation to our senior pastor. Uh, would you just stand as I introduce and greet to you our pastor, Put your hands together for our senior pastor. Come on, come on, come on. Put your hands together. Yes. He has served. Keep going, keep going. He has served 50 uninterrupted years here at the Brookland Church. So yes, we want to give him overwhelming love and appreciation. We appreciate you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. I love how you appreciate our pastor. Amen. And the, the anniversary program is going to be held this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, there's going to be a worship service, and it's going to be live streamed, so you can watch it at your home, uh, or you can join us. We'd love for you to join us. One more time, just praise God for the man of God. 
Woo! As I said, who came down from heaven to West Columbia, South Carolina. We thank God. Yes, now we are fighting against COVID. The Brookline Baptist Church and the Lexington Medical Center, we have formed a partnership. We are fighting this pandemic. So we have partnered and we have organized a clinic, a COVID vaccine clinic right here on the campus of Brookland Baptist Church. Now we're open on Monday through, I'm sorry, that's Monday through Fridays from one o'clock p.m. until four. And then, I'm sorry, one o'clock until six. Uh, let me try that again. On Monday through Fridays, we are open from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. I got it right. I got it. All right. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, we are open from 1 p.m. until 4 p.m. Now, this weekend, we're not going to be open this Sunday because of the celebration, so we are closed, but do come back next week. And when you come back next week, make sure that you bring a picture ID and your COVID card, and um, you'll be ready, all right, to take your shots. Now, I'm excited that last week we served, listen to this, 1,700 persons who came through the door. Yeah. And this, in the first three weeks alone in October, we have serviced now a total, Pastor Jackson, of over 5,200 individuals have taken their shots. Amen. Amen. Praise the living God. Listen, it is offering time. It is offering time in the house of the Lord. Put your hands together. Now, we put our hands together because we know that worship, giving to the Lord, giving your tithe and offering to the Lord is a form of worship. So we worship the Lord when we give unto him. And when you drive up on the Brookland Baptist Church campus, you see where your tithe and your offering goes. You see the building. You see our efforts. You see where we're placing your tithes and your offerings. Amen? Do you see it when you drive up? Amen, amen, amen. So I do want to thank you for your support of um, the vision and where God is leading our pastor. Thank you for partnering with him over the years. Thank you for giving into kingdom building. Amen, amen. We, we couldn't do this without you. We couldn't do this without your gifts, without your offering, without you planting your seeds and your financial offerings. Amen? Amen. Can you just put your hands together? I'd love for you to clap unto the Lord. Amen. Now we're going to do a prayer. Let's go into prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we just are so grateful hmm, to who you are. Not for what you've done, and we're grateful. Right now, God, we are grateful for you loving us, caring for us, providing for us. Thank you for these, your people, who over the years, over the 50 years have come and they have been supportive and they've walked side by side with our pastor as he engaged the people for over 50 years. God, we honor this man of God that you've sent, your son, your under-shepherd here at the Brookland Church. We honor him this afternoon, God. We want to overwhelmingly show our appreciation and love for him. And thank you for the people who are gathering to do just that. God, we bless you for your anointing that's in this place. Rest upon the people today. We give you the praise. We give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. 
And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Right where you are, would you lift your hands all over the room? We worship you, Jesus. Mm, you made a way. Any believe that? Anybody believe that this morning that God made a way? He made a way. Standing here, not knowing how we'll get through this test. But holding on to faith, you know best. Nothing can catch you by surprise. You got this figured out. You're watching us now. And when it looks as if we can win, you wrap us in your arms and step in and everything we need you supply you got this in control and now we know that you you made a way when our backs were when our backs were against the wall and it looked at and it looked as if it was so See you. 
Don't know why, but we're grateful. Anybody grateful this morning? He kept our leader. I'm grateful this morning. He kept this ministry. I'm grateful for it. You made a way. Hey, don't know why, but you did it. You made a Can you sing that? Don't know why. Don't know why, but you did it. You made a way. Come on, all over the room. Don't know why, but you. I'm undeserving, but you made a way. I'm undeserving, but you. standing here only because he made a way and I'm standing yes, yes, here yes, yes. only because God made a way and my family's here woo, only because God woo, and I'm standing here woo, only because God made a way and I'm standing here only because he made a way you made a way you made a way you made I said, I dare you to look back in the museum of your memories and you'll find a don't know how moment. I said, I bet you dare you to look back in the museum of your memories and you'll find a don't know how moment. And I think he says, I'm standing here. I think the lyric says, I'm standing here. And I believe if you start thinking, you'll start thinking. If you start thinking, you'll start thinking. If you start thinking, <laughs> of the goodness of Jesus uh, and all that he's done for you. You'll find a way somewhere over your life where you don't know how you made it. You don't know how you survived that crash. You don't know how you survived that accident. You don't know how you survived that divorce. You don't know how you survived that addiction. You don't know how you survived that predicament. You don't know how you survived 50 years. But I bet you if you start thinking, anybody here grateful? I said, anybody here grateful? Anybody here grateful? Anybody here grateful? Can you give God the praise that he made a way out of no way? And you're not shame to give God praise for what he's done for you? Anybody come to give God praise? Anybody come to give God praise? Because he's made a way. Because I'm standing. Standing here only because you made Because I'm standing. And I'm standing here only because you made a way. Because I'm standing. And I'm standing here only because you made a let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. For I heard David say that let everything, let everything that have breath, everyone that woke up this morning, Everyone who's not at leave is this morning. Uh, everyone who's not in ICU this morning. Uh, everyone who's not on a respirator this morning. Uh, let everything uh, that have breath uh, praise the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord. Give God praise in his sanctuary. Give God praise in his sanctuary right now. Anybody know he's been good? I said anybody know he's been good? So let the redeemed of the Lord Say so, say so, yes! Oh, yeah! Oh, we come to celebrate.
today. We come to celebrate today. I said, we come to celebrate today. I don't know about you, but I'm excited today. We come to celebrate God, not for a man, but we come to celebrate man that God is in the man. I said, we come to celebrate God because God has been in the man, standing behind this desk for 50 years. And you ought not to be so stingy to be sitting down on that pew and not giving God the praise, knowing he the Bible says that everything, well, that everything, ah! oh yeah, oh yeah, that everything, praise the Lord, praise him. We greet you on this Lord's Day morning, if I could get a little bit more on the monitors, in the precious, perennial, powerful, prolific, penetrating, and profitable name of that of Jesus, who is our Christ. Let me thank God this monumental moment. I am humbled. I am honored. And for the first time in my life, I am nervous. I 
I ain't never been nervous to talk in all my life, if you know anything about me. But this is a monumental moment in the life history of this church and especially of its pastor. Let me begin by thanking a few persons for their presence to my wife, Cynthia, my daughter, Leah, my son, Ian. Y'all stand up. They don't get to see y'all on this side. They don't get to see y'all on this side. So this is Cynthia, my 10-year-old angel, Leah, my six-foot-three son, Ian, who we already got a basketball scholarship waiting for you. Still trying to find out who his daddy is, as tall as he is, but I think the mailman in the neighborhood must be tall, amen. <laughs> to my bald head daddy, thank you for being here, Dad. <laughs> to my other bald head daddy, Frank Martin. So glad to have her. Coach Martin and members of our basketball team, y'all stand up. Thank you all. Stand up, stand up, y'all. Thank you all for coming and help us honoring Pastor on his 50th pastoral anniversary. Thank you so very, very much. It means so much to us. And to the Brooklyn Northeast family, who I'm so, again, honored and humbled and blessed to be your under-shepherd. We shut down the Northeast campus on this Sunday to celebrate the visionary, for he is the one that gave vision for the Brooklyn Northeast campus. Someone told me I need to stop saying this, but I can't stop saying that I'm just the babysitter for the vision that God gave him and he has honored me to take care of his child. And you've got to be very careful who you select to keep your children, amen? You don't leave your children into the hands of anyone. And for the rest of my life, as I hold back the tears in my eyes, I thank you for your trust. Northeast, stand up for me. They're sprinkled throughout this congregation. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here to honor our pastor. At this point in time in a pastoral celebration, especially of any black Baptist pastor, I'm supposed to spend the next 15 minutes reminding you how great your pastor is. I'm supposed to tell you to stand up for him, I'm supposed to stand up for his wife, and stand up for his children, stand up for his dog, <laughs> stand up for the turtle, stand up for the cats, show you all and remind you everything he's done, tell you how we grew up together, <laughs> played Uno together, played football together, how we went to college together, how we went to seminary together, how we rode to every Baptist convention together, tell you one funny story, then come back again and tell y'all to stand up again for how good your pastor is to you. But truth be told, and the irony of it, every humble pastor hates that. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 26. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 26. Verses 36 through 39. 
Now we have strategically placed members of the Northeast congregation in every section, just in case y'all West Side folk don't know how to say amen. So if you find the Bible hit the back of your head, that's because you ain't say amen for their pastor as he preaches this gospel. The King James Version of our Bible declares, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Stay right there, Donald. Then saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he went a little farther. And he went a little farther. I want to lift up those words, place a sermonic spotlight there on verse 39 and the A clause of that verse and he went a little farther we preached this morning from the subject farther along farther along we solicit your prayers and if you're not too stingy a few amens along the way I said, if you're not too stingy. <laughs> Northeast, start throwing your Bibles. <laughs> my brothers and my sisters, chapter 26 of the gospel according to Matthew chronicles the second half of the week of Jesus' march towards Calvary. Chapter 26 begins with him preparing his disciples to celebrate the Passover. He tells them to go into a city and find a man and let that man know that he is desirous of using his home. And they find a man's home and they go to an upper room on a dead-end street. But while he is planning the Passover, one of his disciples is plotting. While he's planning, one of his disciples is plotting. I said, while he's planning, one of his disciples is plotting. He is planning to celebrate the Passover as is introduced to us in Exodus chapter 14, where the children of Israel are told before they leave, Egypt, to take a pure lamb, kill that lamb, and slaughter that lamb, and cook that lamb, and then take unleavened bread, which is simply bread that does not have yeast in it, 
He tells them to make unleavened bread without yeast because he knows that when you put yeast in anything that it will mold, it will go bad quicker if it does not have yeast. They don't know at the time that they're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years, but Jesus knew they were going to be in the wilderness for 40 years, and he wanted to make sure they had enough substance even before the manna fell from heaven. Jesus already knows what you're about to go through even before you go through it. And so he's there to celebrate the feast of the Passover. And after they do the rituals of celebrating the feast of the Passover, he tells them that one of you who eateth with me has already betrayed me. And each one of them looks with chagrin and asks and raises the query, Lord, is it I? Even though one of them had already sold out the Savior. For the Bible tells us that he went and found the chief priest to sell out the Savior. The Bible says that he went to the chief priest. The Bible says he went to the chief priest. The chief priest didn't come to him. He went to them. See, sometimes it ain't the devil, it's you. I'll say that one more again for these people on this side. We always want to blame when we do stuff wrong on the devil. But sometimes we go where we want to go. And commonly, sometimes people really ain't that saved. Sometimes people be talking about, I don't go to the places I used to go. The reason why you don't go to the places you used to go, because they closed. You don't go to secrets no more because it's closed. You don't go to the fountain blue no more because it's closed. It ain't because you done got all holy and saved. You just can't go there no more. Ain't nobody want to say nothing to the preacher. That you, ain't, you ain't all that holy. You just can't go no more. Try this side. But the Bible says that he went to sell out the Savior. But Jesus already knew that he had sold him out. And see, that's why you don't have to ever be worried. And sometimes you need to delight yourself when there's a Judas in your camp. Every camp, every sorority, every fraternity, every meeting, every organization, especially every church, every choir, every musical council, everybody got a Judas. And you need to thank God sometimes for the Judases in your life because without Judas, Jesus doesn't get to Calvary. Without Calvary, you don't get your soul forgiven. So you need a Judas in your life to get you to where you're going. And sometimes Judas will commit suicide by par Oh, let me not say that. Let me not say that. There's a Judas in everybody's life. And without Judas, you don't get to where you need to get to get to. I wish I had a witness in here that can look back over your life and see some people who tried to stab you in your back, tried to get you fired. But look at you now. You're still on the job. Now you're the supervisor. Now you're the ball now you're making more money than you ever made and they ain't got nothing and after celebrating the Passover he then clears the table puts the leftovers sister brown in Tupperware dishes takes the bread that has been left over from the supper, breaks that bread, and I wish I had time to talk about the crumbs that are left over on the table, because we as a people have been making it on crumbs all of our lives. And every time you break bread, there's going to be some crumbs. Invite me back, and I'll talk to you about the crumbs from the Christ. You got to pay me twice, though. Um, he breaks bread and institutes this new supper that we now call the Lord's Supper, where he talks about this bread which will represent his body and this wine which will represent his blood and he does it for the remission of your sins. And then the Bible says they go out singing a hymn to the Mount of Olives. Everybody needs a song because when you're melancholy, when you're depressed, you need a song. Whether you can sing or not, you need a song. You need to know amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You need to know, oh, God, me thou, thou great Jehovah pilgrim through this parent land. Even though I can't sing, pastor can't sing, every now and then we make that shower head a microphone and we sing our hearts out in the shower, just me and Jesus alone. I can't sing on the choir, they ain't going to give me no mic, but everybody needs a song in your heart to get you through and because Jesus is going through something he has a song in his heart and that's why he's singing a song to make it through and they go literally across the street help me somebody to the garden of Gethsemane 
That word Gethsemane means wine press. If you go to Israel where I've been, past has been, it's literally across the street from the gated walls of Jerusalem. And he takes his 12 disciples to Gethsemane, but he leaves nine at the base of the mountain and only takes three up the mountain. It's 12 of them, but he only takes three up, Peter, James, and John. He leaves nine at the bottom of the mountain, and he only takes three up into the mountain. He leaves nine dad at the bottom of the mountain, but only takes three up the mountain. Sister Bassfield, he leaves nine at the bottom of the mountain, but only takes three at the bottom of the mountain. I need to let you know that every crew ain't true, and every friend ain't designed to climb. Let me say that one more again because you missed it. Every crew ain't true and every friend is not help designed to climb. You don't miss your shout. Every crew is not true and every friend is not there to design to help you climb. Everybody who's in your crew ain't really for you. And everybody who's even with you sometimes ain't there to help you climb. You can't take everybody up the mountain with you. Everybody can't go all the way with you. Sometimes you just got to go with Jesus and Jesus alone. I never understood why preachers sometimes say it's lonely being a pastor until I became a pastor, Flynn. And now I know why people say and pastors say it's lonely because sometimes it's just Jesus and you alone. Because that sometimes God will tell you some things that are crazy. That sometimes God will tell you to do some things that don't make sense. Uh, that sometimes that God will tell you to do something that your family don't understand. But you have no choice but to do it. And you find yourself by yourself. And that's why pastoring can be lonely sometimes. When they tell you you're going to move from Montessori Street on the Sunset Drive in the most racist county in South Carolina. And build the biggest complex in the state of South Carolina. And nobody believes you. Your deacon's is not behind you. Your financial planner say, don't do Northeast, but sometimes you got to do stuff because you know God told you to do it. And sometimes it gets lonely out here when you know what God has told you to do, but nobody else knows. And that's why the Bible says that he's exceedingly sorrowful. He tells them to tarry here. And as you know, the story, if you've been to vacation Bible school once or twice, eating is just to get the cookies and the Kool-Aid. Even those three, Frank, fell asleep on him. But the Bible says, Flynn, that he went a little farther. Even though the three he chose to climb fell asleep on him, he went a little farther. You know, I, I've been praying and meditating and wondering how a man like Pastor Jackson has been pastoring for 50 years and many of my generation can't stay in the pulpit 50 days. <laughs> Charles, U.S. News and World Report declared that 25% of all pastors will quit this year alone. Every month we hear of a pastor committing suicide, pastors quitting, getting fed up with pastoring. And it's our generation that's quitting. And I've been trying to wonder, Mark, why our generation is punking out on the pulpit. What makes pastors' generation die in the pulpit and pass until God calls them on home? And my generation is punking out on the pulpit. Is the calling different? Is the relationship different? Is the love of God different? Or do some people think of this as an occupation? 
and not convocation. Because when you are convicted of your calling, you will stay on the battlefield until God calls you on home. And I've been wondering, Charles, why so many of our generation, as I say before, have been punking out on the pulpit. And why I applaud the God consciousness of our senior pastor who's been standing on the wall for 50 years. And it ain't over. This is his 50th year celebration, not his 50th year retirement party. What makes him different than the rest who have been quitting on their sheep and walking away from their pastures? The answer is here in the text. You don't mind if I engage the text a little bit, do you? What time Dallas play? First of all, I, I want you to see in this text Jesus' determination. I want you to see in the text Jesus' determination. If you recall, when, when he's in Bethany with his disciples, he says, there lies the place upon my intended destination. He's looking unto Jerusalem. He says, we, we, we've got to go to Jerusalem. And the disciples are scared. They're mad. They're upset. And they're like, why you want to go to Jerusalem? You've already heard that the people want to kill you when you get to Jerusalem. Matter of fact, if they kill you, they're going to kill us too. Why do we need to go to Jerusalem? Why don't we just stay here in the safety and the comfort of Bethany where we had Mar bed, Martha and, and Mary's bed and breakfast? We can just stay here with three hots and a cot and don't have to worry about what's about to happen in Jerusalem. Why, why are we going to stay here? Why are we going to go and go to Jerusalem? But he is determined to get to Calvary. There's a determination here that even though he knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem, even though he knows that there's some things going to happen and they have been plotting to kill him, he is determined to carry out the call upon which God has asked him to do. And I believe that over 50 years of pastoring this church, there's had to be some determination to complete everything that pastor has been able to complete. And I'm not, again, applauding the man because I don't applaud man. Dust is flesh and flesh is a mess. So I'm not applauding his flesh. I'm applauding the God consciousness in here, the master plan that he created, the vision that's now completed in every building, every ministry. And people have asked why he don't let Charles Jr. do it. Why don't he let Joshua friend? Because he ain't tell Charles Jr. to do it. He told him to do this and he had been determined all of his life to get this done I wish I had somebody witness with me there's been a determination to make sure to see it through and that's the problem with a whole lot of us that God has told us what to do God has told us to start that building God has told us to finish that um, degree God has told us to complete some things in our life but we have not had the determination the way this man has been determined to see it through I wish I had a few Christians in here that would just see it through what God has asked you to do and if you have a little bit of determination it will come to pass uh, anyone who want to give God credit right now and why don't want to give God praise right now that this man has been determined to make sure what God has asked him to do has been completed here on earth he says I've got to go to Jerusalem but then there comes this period of contemplation there is the determination to get to Jerusalem but once he gets up into Gethsemane, there is contemplation. And the reason why there is contemplation, because he knows what's in that cup he just talked about. He knows despair is in the cup. He knows depression is in the cup. But most importantly, he knows there's death in the cup. And the problem is, Carmelita, is because he has never ever had to deal with death. He's all life. He's all creation. Remember, he was there when God cut on the light switch. He was there when God took a wet vac and sucked up the waters and separated it from the firmament. He was there when God took green grass and rolled it out into a new home like carpet. 
He was there when God tacked down the green grass with trees and shrubs and dandelions and snapdragons and carnations and roses. He was, he was there when he went to a secluded garden on the eastern shore of Africa and took out some African dust and formed that dust and shaped that dust and created that dust to look like this. And then he breathed his nuwak, his breath of life, into the dust and the dust became a living human being. He took in animation and made animation. He was beginning to begin before the beginning ever began to be gone. He only knows life so he does not know how to deal with death. So that's the contemplation. How do I deal with something I'm not familiar with? Daddy! Why have you forsaken me? I know this was the agreement in the beginning. I know you and I talked about this when you made the world. I know that I was going to have to go down and die for humanity. But daddy, I don't know how this thing is going to work out. Daddy, I've never shut my eyes. I don't know what darkness is like. I don't know what Sheol, which is hell, is like. Daddy, how do I handle this? And I will tell you, I want to thank God that I've had two daddies. My wife don't even know sometimes who I'm talking to. Because when they both call, I say, hey, daddy. My staff don't know who I'm talking to. When they both call, I say, hey, daddy. My children don't know who I'm talking to. When I say, hey, daddy, Ian calls him big pastor. But I want to thank God that when I am perplexed, when I have to deal with the vicissitudes of life, I can call my daddies to get advice, to get understanding of what is going on. Because after this determination and after this contemplation, there is the realization that death is in the cup. And there's nothing we can do about it because death is in everybody's cup. All of us have a date with death. All of us have a reservation with some cemetery without the privilege of cancellation. All of us have to realize that there even is a crucifixion in our lives. And daddy, I know, I'm talking to my spiritual daddy right now, that you've been crucified all your life. And I know as I meditated, dad, one of the reasons why God has paired us together and why this partnership has been perfect. I know why God had us both joined, born on July 16th. I know why God had us both join the greatest fraternity ever created. I know why God had me to leave my home church at 15 to come to Brooklyn. I still want to thank Lisa Chavis for saving me a seat. And Lisa, if you watch and you get a free funeral when you die, you got a coupon that leaves that don't never expire. Because some of y'all remember when we were on Monticello Street, you had to get there at 8 o'clock to get a seat at the 11 o'clock service. And Lisa Chavis was my angel, and she would save a seat for me every Sunday at the church because I didn't get there till 1059. And she didn't know then that she was an instrument of inspiration because God had a plan. We didn't know then what God's plan was for us, Daddy. But God had a plan. And I know just like you and just like me, every lie that's been told on a man has been told on you. Every lie that's been told on a man has been told on me. We both have been crucified without even having to go to Calvary. But one thing about it, even though we've been crucified, even though people have called us everything but a child of God, I understand that every time somebody mentions our name, they got to blow out hot air. And you know what makes a balloon rise? It's hot air, Charles Jr. And all of our haters have become our elevators. Everybody, somebody talks about us, we rise. We keep going higher and we keep going higher because when you put your hand in the master's hand no matter what anybody says about you no hell no high water can come between you and the love of God I wish I had a witness here that somebody else had been lied upon somebody else had been told everything but the child of God but look how God has blessed you look how God has raised you look how God has taken your father
There's this realization that I've got to deal with death. And after he realizes he's got to deal with death, then there's this communication. He begins to talk with the Father. And when I have gone again through every trial in my life, and there have been several, I have to talk with the Father. And I know this is the most praying Negro in the world. Anytime I talk with him, I don't care if we got to talk about the football game, he's going to end with prayer. If we're just talking about the choir, he's going to end with prayer. If we're talking about the finances, we're going to end with prayer. He's the most praying man I know because he's got communication with the Father. And that's why Jesus had to go on a little farther because sometimes you can't talk to God with a lot of people around you. You can't hear from God with a lot of people around you. Sometimes God has got to get you by yourself in rarefied air. That's why he had to go higher. Somebody say higher. Somebody say higher. He had to go higher up the mountain to have a little talk with Jesus. That's why our ancestors used to say, with a third grade education, steal away. Steal away. Steal away to Jesus. I ain't got time to stay here. Then they will say, let us go down by the river to have a little talk with Jesus. Tell them all about my troubles. He will. I said, anybody know he will? He will hear my earnest cry. Then a little prayer wheel will be turning. And I feel the fire burning. Just have a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. And I know that's how you made it 50 years. Because you've been hooked up with the holy. I know times have gotten dark. I know times have gotten tough. I've heard you say it in my own presence. In your early pastorate, you hated when Sunday morning came. You hated Sunday mornings. As a young preacher and a young pastor, you weren't like David. You weren't happy when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I know all the trials and the tribulations that you've been through. I want to thank you for the confidence and the trust as we talk one with another. And it hasn't been just reserved for your early years. Even in your latter years, if you tried to do more and more for the Savior. It seemed like the more you've done, the more blocks and roadblocks the devil has placed in your way. Even from the people who said they supported you. Every time you wanted to build something, the people say, why he keep building stuff? Why he keep begging for money? But it ain't about you. It ain't about us. Our name ain't on nothing. Well, first of all, they didn't vote me in Northeast, so they can't vote me out, but if they ever get on my nerves, I'm just going to take the pictures of my two children and something, I'm out. That's why we ain't put our names on nothing around here, because none of this is ours. This all belongs to Jesus Christ. But I know you've had some rough years, even in your latter years, where people didn't support and understand your vision and see what God told you to do. But every now and then, people need, like you used to say, a seeing our dog. Because when they can't see the vision, they have to trust the pastor. And even though people have left, even though some of y'all ain't gave a dime to none of these buildings, we still got them. Because the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. And there have been enough believers, I said there have been enough believers uh, to believe in his vision uh, that God has given on high. I wish I had a witness here uh, who can thank God and who are grateful uh, that there have been uh, just enough believers uh, who have sown just enough uh, to make sure that we move mountains for community. Not so that his name gets the glory, not so that his name gets the praise, but that God gets the glory for all of our good works. I 
Over 50 years, this man has had determination. Over 50 years, there have been periods of contemplation. Over 50 years, you've had to come to points of realization. But through it all, I know you've been in constant communication. And I hope right now, after 50 years of pastoring, you had a point of pacification. There's been determination. There's been contemplation. There's been realization. There's been communication. But I hope now, Dad, after 50 years, you had a point of pacification. That word pacification is just a big old polysyllabic word for peace. I hope, Dad, after 50 years of going through all you've been through, you had a period of peace. It's right there in the text. Jesus is exceedingly sorrowful. He tarries there and talks with the Father. He comes to the realization that he's going to die. He tells Dad, I, I, I don't want to have to do this. But then he says, not thy will, but thy will be done. I'm sure as an 18-year-old lad, you didn't want to have to do this. And I'm sure even now at 69, you still don't want to have to do this. But I know that you're at peace because God has told you to do this. And when God has told you to do something, you have to do it because you will not be at peace unless you do what God has asked you to do. And even though you've been through trials and tribulations, even though you've been up the rough side of the mountain, even though you've had to go through valleys, ups and downs, I hope you now realize that you had a place of peace, knowing that you have not finished, but at least you've completed everything God has asked you to do. I don't know how many years God will have you stand beyond and behind this pulpit. But one of the things that has impressed me all my life is that you keep on going a little farther. I'm talking about a man when I joined Brooklyn Church at a 1988 Lincoln town car. The one that Medea uses in her movies. And God on three times tried to kill that car. Three different times the car was totaled. And every time one got totaled, he'd find another one, just like the old one. I'm talking about a man who was down in Bessemer, Alabama, preaching revival, driving down the street and saw an 88 Lincoln Town Car and bought it right on the spot. I'm talking about a man until 2000, the year 2000, only wore white shirts. The first blue shirt he wore was in 2000 because I bought it for him. I'm talking about a man that's so humble. And I say this not to be mean or disrespectful, but so simple that when he takes off his suit, Frank, he puts the tie that go with the suit on the same hanger so he don't have to figure out what tie go with the suit. I'm talking about a man that's so humble that I would say, Daddy, you got to get a better car because you're making us, your members, look bad. I said, you driving this 1988 Lincoln in 2000 make us look like we don't tithe. Can you at least get a camera? I mean, something, Dad. Could you make us look bad like we don't give? But it ain't all about materials for him. It's all about being peace with the Savior. And I want to thank God, Dad, that I know you right now in peace. You've been talking lately that this is the happiest period of your life. And I want to thank God that God has given you that peace, that you're now in rarefied air, that you've done everything God has asked you to do. And I'm always shocked how keep, you keep going on and on and on and on like the Energizer Bunny. But that's because God has given you the power. God has given you the power because you got peace. I'm reminded of that day when Jesus and his disciples were on the Sea of Galilee. And I've been on that Sea of Galilee in Israel. It's calm 
when it wants to be. And you got to understand that the Sea of Galilee is really just a pond. It ain't no real sea. But they call it the Sea of Galilee. And because of the depth of the sea, it's very shallow, Charles Jr. And because it's very shallow, it don't take a whole lot of wind to make the waters rustle. And if you read your Bible once or twice, you know on that day that he and his disciples were on the Sea of Galilee, the winds began to rage. The lightning began to have a limbo game with the clouds. The thunder dogs began to bark. The sea began to turn and toss. And as the disciples were worried, come on, Tonto, let's ride on out. Put me in E flat. As the sea began to turn and toss, the disciples began to get worried. But Jesus was on the hinder part of the ship. He was sleeping on seats, sheets of serenity, under blankets of blessings, and on a pillow of peace. And even though, Dad, the ship was tossing and turning, they were worried, but he was calm. And they went down to the bottom of the ship and said, Master, carest not that we perish. And you've seen the next part of the scene. For the Bible says that he got up out of his slumber. And like Leo and DiCaprio in Titanic, he went up to the hull of the ship and said, peace, be still. And the wind began to shut up. The lightning began to stop flashing. And I want to tell you why they stopped. Because even the wind wanted to hear the next thing that the master had to say. And I tell you one thing, the reason why I've been coming to this church since I was 15. Because I wanted to hear the next thing that the master had to say to this man. And I know I'm not the only one that comes here Sunday after Sunday because I need to hear <laughs> the next thing <laughs> that the master has to say <laughs> out of this man. <laughs> I need a witness here this morning <laughs> that can tell the world <laughs> that great things have been happening through this man. Great things have been happening through this church. And that's why you've been able to go farther, farther along. We'll know all about it. Father along, we'll understand why. So cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. For we'll understand it by and by. Congratulations on 50 years of pastoring. Father alone, 
I stand to tell you today, he knows all about you. And there may be one today who is standing in the balance, want to get closer to the Lord, someone seeking a relationship with him. You may be sitting among us. You may also be live screening. But if you don't have a relationship with God today, we invite you to give your life to the Lord. You can start by calling the number on the screen at 803-744-7941. God desires you to fall in love with him today. For Father alone knows all about you. And you may desire prayer today. And if that is so, we want you to call the number that's listed on the screen at 1-877-796-8380. The intercessors are standing by to receive your call. No matter where you're calling from, they're waiting to pray with you. So today, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And if there's one who don't want to come forth now, bow your heads for just a second. And all you got to do is say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. I want a relationship with you. Amen. You may have your seats. I want to thank Pastor Chris Levy, our campus pastor. Come on, let's give him a hand of praise. And let's praise God for that message. Father alone, for he knows all about us. What a great message. And we want to thank the Northeast Campus for joining their pastor. We know we are one church in two locations, but to come over and thank enough of you, Pastor Jackson, to have fellowship with you today. I want to say to you, please join us. This isn't the last message. We had one at eight o'clock this morning to encourage our pastor, one on, at 11 o'clock with Pastor Chris Levy to encourage our pastor, and there's another at four o'clock p.m. where we will have the anniversary service with Pastor James Hall from Triumph Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who will be here to help celebrate 50 years, Pastor Jackson. I tell you, I'm like Pastor Chris Levy. 50 years is something to praise God for. So please come back. If you're live screaming, we will be live screaming. We will be on Facebook, and we will be in person here at Brooklyn Baptist Church. Come and join us to celebrate our very own pastor, Pastor Charles B. Jackson Sr.'s 50th anniversary. May God bless you. The other thing I'd like to say to you is please remain seated after I have given the benediction so the ushers can lead you out. God bless you and have a wonderful day. May you stand, please. So now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to pre present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. And let the church say, 